Thank you so much. I actually was planning to talk to you about how to be the world's worst law professor, but then I started thinking, for the rest of my life, when anyone Googled my name, <laughs> that's right, and I may not be a genius, but I'm smart enough to know what a terrible marketing move that would have been in my career. So, 48 hours ago, I changed it to how to be the world's best law professor. Now, you're probably wondering, now that's pretty amazing that she would get up in front of us and talk to us about how to be the world's best law professor. Who is she to lecture to us about that? And that, in fact, is what's revealing. Because what am I doing right now? Lecturing. That's right. And what do we know about lecturing? <laughs> you right now are going to retain 5% of what I say. Not 50%, not 15%, but 5%. By every pedagogical method, we know that lecturing is the worst teaching style to use. And yet, some of us use it anyway, including me right now. So maybe I am the world's worst law professor and I should have stayed with my original title because I seem to know something about that. Now the nice thing though about being in legal education is that um, when we do teach, including when we lecture, there is benefits to that. As a matter of fact, believe it or not, teaching is the most effective learning method. So standing up here right now in front of all of you, I'm learning a lot. I actually am going to retain 90% of what I teach you today. You may only retain 5%, but that's okay, because it's all about me. Teaching is the way to learn. And I want you to think about what opportunities do you give your students to teach in your law school courses. Because if you're not providing them opportunities to teach, then they're not learning at the highest level available to us based upon the educational research. So think about ways that you can allow your students to work together in teams with peer teaching and tutoring and how you can build that into your classes if you want to be the world's best law professor. Now, to be honest with you, most of us, most of the time, don't find ways to build teaching into our classrooms. But what we do do is we find ways to develop group discussions. We've talked a little bit today about the Socratic method, and the good news is, is that the Socratic method is way better than just pure lecturing like they do in a lot of other higher ed courses. Um, so we are using better methodologies in a lot of our courses by allowing for the Socratic method and group discussions where our students are engaged orally. They're retaining about 50% of what they learn in that type of setting. But as was revealed earlier, there are anxiety aspects to that because of the public nature of that methodology in the law school classroom. And so is there a better way? There sure is. The second best way to teach our students based upon the educational research, second to teaching, is through practice. So those clinics, those externships, those simulated courses, they're retaining approximately 75% of what they learn, of what we teach them, uh, and what their clients teach them, and their experiences teach them, because of course this is not teacher-centered anymore. So they're retaining about 75% of those courses. And earlier this week I was reading Bob Kuhn's article about pricing clinical legal education, and I couldn't help but think to myself, what would be the values assigned to courses if we measured the output of those courses, the students' learning in, um, outcomes, rather than the price of the teachers in those classrooms, many of whom are using educational styles, educational methods that, retain, that lead to our students' retention of 50% or less. So what else do we do in the law school classroom? Well, reading. What do you think the retention rate is for reading? 10%. That's right. You read the slide. Good for you. <laughs> Processing multiple words at the same time. Exactly. Active learning. So we have our students read books that are this thick at a price of about $1,000 per semester for them to retain 10%. Now, maybe I am the world's worst law professor, 
But based upon our students assigned reading lists, I'm thinking I've got some competition. Because in almost every law school that we're from, we're having our students spend ten, tens of thousands or thousands of dollars, I should say, thousands of dollars over the course of their law school career in order for them to use materials from which they will have a 10% retention rate. And I think that we can do better than that. What's worse is that we sometimes tell them to reread. <laughs> well, guess what rereading does? The retention drops lower, especially after the second time you read something. So when they start to reread it after the discussion or the classroom with the Socratic methodology where you're re-examining the reading from which they only retain 10%, well, they're retaining even less from that rereading. And then guess what? What else do we tell them to do? We tell them to read, we tell them to reread, and then we tell them highlight. We sell whole packets of highlighters in our, in our law school bookstores, and those highlighters, what they do is they disaggregate the information for our students, and so they're not making the connections across the content that's necessary in graduate school education. So some of us are lecturing, most of us are assigning text-heavy readings. Most of us are encouraging our students to highlight so they're processing, processing this information. And I'm thinking, what do we do right? Well, what else do we teach our students? We teach them to outline. And what do you think the educational research shows us about outlining? It's uncertain. That's right. We really don't know whether this works or not. So I'm thinking we may have a whole nation of legal educators, and we're all competing to do the same thing. We're lecturing, we're telling our students to read, we're telling them to reread, we're telling them to highlight, we might be telling them to outline, and of these, the only thing that we know might work, but we're not really sure, is outlining. So maybe we wanna be the world's worst law professors, but no, because you know what we know and what we do, we test our students. Don't we test our students? Yeah, we love testing our students. And what do we know from the educational research about testing? It works. Testing really works. But there's a problem. And the problem is we do it all wrong. Because the kind of testing that works is not the high stakes testing that we do at the end of the course. It's asking questions before you even begin. If you test your students before the content is delivered to them, they are much more likely to retain that content, to be thinking about that content, than if you test them at the end. So this means that even the stuff that theoretically we could be doing right, we're not, because we're doing it the wrong way, because we're not reading the educational research and we're not applying what we know, so we really have no excuse. And you're thinking, well, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna organize all these tests and engage them through quizzes and things like that? But guess what? The beauty of your life is that you're a legal educator in the 21st century, which means you don't have to do this. You have the technology where you can set up the questions for your students, you can group them together, you can allow the students to go online and do the self-testing and the self-administered quizzes, and they can get their scores back, and they can have explanations that automatically come up about why their answer was wrong or why their answer was right. And it's very low uh, labor-intensive. So you can do this, and there's really no excuse in this day and age. I'm sorry, I thought with my elf ears that this would never come off, but not so lucky. So let me talk to you about something else that we know works, but that we're not really doing in legal education. If you want to be the world's best law professor, and not the world's worst law prof professor, you need to start thinking about distributed practice. <coughs> This is sometimes called spaced education. Not because this is a Star Trek method that you need to worry about somewhere in the future. It's because it's known today, it's understood today, and it's widely practiced today in other professional graduate schools such as medical schools. And what it means is that you're exposed to information repeatedly over time. And that by being exposed to it repeatedly over time, you're more likely to retain it, you're more likely to understand it. Now, it could be that you introduce or you revisit concepts with students weekly. It could be through these 
uh, self quizzes that you make available for them on your internet website, course website. But the important thing is that rather than teach them something early in the course and then have them cram at the end of the course where they're not like, likely to retain it or at least not very much of it after the course ends and then they have to cram again before the bar and kind of learn it all, all over again or most of it all over again, that you expose it to that information across the semester and maybe even across law school in a process that's called interleaving. And you need to start thinking about it. what if we were to stretch content out across semesters, across years, and even lead them into practice. Then you're going to give them a knowledge base that they're going to be, be able to carry forward over a long period of time rather than they're just to the end of the course where they're trying to take the quiz. What else do we know works? Collaboration. We have an entire educational system that's set up on competition. And all the research that's coming out of MIT and other top universities is that what often creates better performance is not competition, but is actually working together. And when we allow our students to collaborate, remember how at the beginning of my lecture of which you're retaining only 5%, <laughs> remember that teaching, teaching others is one of the best, is the best way to learn. And so by having students collaborate, you create opportunities for them to teach one another, and then they're gonna retain the highest level possible. And then finally, we know that visuals help and stories help. Jeffrey Ritter is gonna talk in a few minutes about visuals, so I'm not gonna talk much about that right now. So let's focus on stories. Humanity has passed down our history and our knowledge largely through stories for millennia. Our brains are programmed to retain information through stories. Guess what? This is one of the aspects of that Socratic method that works having that case method, every case is a story. And it allows our students to embed facts in a meaningful content and to take those facts and marry them to legal elements and to their analysis. So there, again, there are aspects of the Socratic method that works. And part of it is the stories that we use in telling them. And so to the extent that we can retain that storytelling so that it can organize the content that we want our students to retain, we should, but we need to do it in kinder, gentler, perhaps, less public uh, testing methodology. So in the end, each of us has a choice that we can aspire to be the world's worst law professor. And if you want to do that, you know what you should do. That you need to do a lot of lecturing, <laughs> you need to assign a lot of reading, and even better, have them do rereading and rereading. Give them packs of highlighters. And you'll do a really beautiful job of being competitive in that way. But there's another choice. We now have the knowledge. We know what works. And if you want to be the world's best law professor, then find the right ways for your students to test. Give them opportunities to test across time. Create opportunities for them to teach one another because we know that that works. Encourage them to collaborate, not compete. Give them stories to share, to hear, to learn, and to use visuals. And when you do that, you will help your students to become the best that they can be, and perhaps we in turn will become better, and maybe someday even the very best. Thank you. <laughs>